So today we are moving in the direction of uh, geography. Uh, our our, our uh, lecture today is a professor from the um, uh, uh, School of uh, Department of Education, uh, Geography. Sorry. Uh, and uh, I strongly, before I say anything about our uh, about Dr. Baldwin, strongly encourage you to take Dr. Baldwin's courses or some of his uh, colleagues' courses. You might think that geography is, you know, countries' capitals and main transports and things like that. Geography is like the hardest thing going uh, in terms of it's about human beings and their relation with their environment, essentially, right? right. Um, all kinds of exciting, interesting things that come out of it. And Dr. Baldwin, Baldwin's classes are especially sought after. And students, students love the work of Dr. Baldwin. He has his PhD and his master's degree at the University of Oregon in geography. Bachelor's degree is finance. I was curious about it. It was 15 years between. Oh, okay. so he came back. Um, you can do that, by the way. Um, nobody ever stops learning. That's part of the game, right? Um, so he has published incredibly widely. I love reading Dr. Baldwin's um, CV today. He publishes in uh, the area of how fevers will make terrain with the dams, right? and how that affects history. I mean, it's incredible. But he also publishes in how tourism impacts local uh, populations and how tourism impacts the world. He publishes in food and its, and its impacts. He's always interested in sustainable communities and sustainable philosophies and approaches to living. Please give Dr. Jeff Baldwin a warm welcome. It's not state capitals. I don't have a PhD in state capitals, right? That's what Google's for. I'm a human environment geographer, and uh, all three of my colleagues in my department are human environment geographers. If you take a geography class, you will not memorize state capitals. I don't know the state capitals. That's what Google is for. What I do is look at in relationships between environments and people. And what I want to talk about today is, uh, well, our most intimate relationship, you might say, food, right? Um, 200 years ago, this guy named Thomas Malthus noticed that in London, that food production was increasing, but that population was increasing even more rapidly. And what he suggested was this, that in London in 1800, the poor people were having large families, five, six, seven children. Now, if two people have four children, those four children do the same thing. The next generation has eight, the next generation has 16, the next generation has 32, 64, 128, 256. You get it? It looks like this. This actually is what human populations have done over the past 2,000 years. We have had exponential growth in the past few cycles, been especially marked. Malthus said that at some point we're going to run out of food. Right? We were smart monkeys, we're making more food each year, but we're populating the planet more rapidly than we can grow the food. So this idea of crisis kind of becomes central to thinking about people, food, population, and global environments. This is actually a diagram of what human population has done and how that peak 50. We think it's going to sort of slow down around 2050 at about 10.5 billion. We're at 7.5 billion now, so that's not a 20 percent increase by then. The question is, do you have enough resources to feed everybody at that time? Slide in the past, sorry. I want to learn more, take my class. Next semester, my uh, colleague, Professor Lane, is teaching a class on food systems. It's not a division, but we want to about food systems. That's how you do it. Um, history shows we've never had a global crisis in food supply. We've never had a global famine as long as we can remember food. We've always been able to produce about as much as we need sometimes a bit more. Local shortage is sure, and that often has to do more with market than it does with actual global supply. So, what we've done in the past 80 years is rapidly increase our food supply. And the first 50 or 60 years of this project was done through what we call the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is this idea that we're going to have partnerships between foundations that have money. Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation. We're going to then join that with governments and state schools. Right? Most states in the United States have schools that are ag research schools. That's what Davis is, uh, one of the things Davis focuses on here in California. In Oregon, we have Oregon State, Washington, Washington State. Right? 
focusing on how we make more food. Uh, we also then get the United Nations Institute involved with this and uh, for related kinds of institutions. So we get Zenit, I guess. Okay. One of the first efforts was in Mexico in the late 30s to figure out how can we grow wheat and more wheat and deal with the diseases, the diseases that we're facing. Right? And great success with that. More long as we did. Uh, about 20 years later, early 60s, we get the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Rice is such an important crop, so much of humanity, right? For about a third of us, rice is the center of our diet. And then a little bit later, we start looking at corn, and potatoes, right? We're going to get these staples, get those going, so that we can feed everybody. We do this through technologies. Unfortunately, we tend to go to technologies rather than actually changing the cultures of society. It's much easier to change the technology than to change all of you. Right? So that's the easy technical fix. I'll probably kind of ties this in a minute. Technologies are this. We were losing about a third of our crops of pests. Pests include insects, fungus, weeds, things that we eat with our food and our fields. So let's create stuff that kills those. Irrigation. Irrigation does two things. First of all, if we have a drought, but we have irrigation, we don't lose our crop. So irrigation is insurance. The second thing that irrigation does is it allows us to go into lands that are too dry to farm now. The soils may be great, but not enough water. If we put water from that, then we can increase production. So this has been a very, very important uh, technology. If you go to the Central Valley during growing season, you'll see there's sprinklers for flood irrigation. Same with the Imperial Valley, same with Salinas Valley, all of our crops, most of our crops in California are irrigated. Even Frosty Tree in Mendocino is irrigated, right? That's marijuana. Okay. <laughs> How much irrigation do we have? Well, this, this color, 75 to 100 percent of that land is under irrigation. Right? So you can see, especially in northern India there, a lot of irrigation. If you look at eastern China, a lot of irrigation. And where do most of the people live in the world? What are the two most populous countries in the world? Number one is China, good. And number two is India, India yes. Irrigation, food, right? And as a result, since the 1960s, no, well, India had a little episode, no terrible famines, right? Now, there are some lighter colored areas here, not so much irrigation, but we're still looking at 10% irrigation, 20, 35% of the area under irrigation, right? Take that away, you drop the food production. Third technology is fertilizer. It turns out that if you plant a plant, the plant takes nutrients from the soil. You don't replace those nutrients, and the next year that plant's not going to do very well. Now there are ways to replace that nutrient, and human farmers figured out all kinds of ways, but there's no way to sort of centralize this, to industrialize this, and so we start with these industrial synthetic fertilizer. As a result, this boosts yields in some places two, threefold. It allows us to do double crops in some places, two crops a year with fertilizer. Mechanization. So, again, this is sort of the first world looking at the developing world, going, how can we help the developing world have more product production here? Well, there's too much labor in the field. What we need to do is standardize the crops and then mechanize that. We need to use tractors, we use this cheap oil resource we have instead of this expensive human resource. That's kind of how it's off. It's expensive human resource. Are there places in the world where there's not a job today? You might be farm. Do you have any chance of getting a job in India with a college degree is? What you have a college degree? It's about 50 50. There are not enough jobs in India for college graduates with that degree, right? We're talking about 7.5 million people here graduating college in India not getting jobs. You might be well instead of in agriculture, not under recognition at home. Again, under recognition, we get great increased production. And then we start doing this, high yielding varieties of seeds. And this is what a lot of the Green Revolution is focused on, what Norman Borlaug focused on, what our universities have focused on up through the 1960s was, wow, we've got, for example, two strains of rice here, right? We've got this strain that is resistant to stem borers. So stem borers are these little insects that like the origin stems of rice, suck out all the nutrients. But it doesn't produce a lot of seed. Right? Then we got this variety over here that, wow, look at all the rice on top of that. That would be great. Except that this has no resistance to stem borders. So what we do is we cross pollinate these. 
Because it's not a medical application. This is simply selective breeding, right? And humans have been doing this for oh, about 10,000 years with plants. As a result of 10,000 years of doing this, we have about 8,000 varieties of rice in the world. Right? Now, if you go to Oliver's, how many varieties of rice do you see? Yeah. Oliver's, right? <laughs> well, maybe eight or nine. 8,000 varieties, right? People have been breeding rice for drier land, wetter land, cooler land, shadier land, right? What works best? You take the best plant there, you save the seeds and plant next year, and you get the top of the best. You need to save the best plant, the best seeds that year, and again, pretty soon you have a year to raise the rice. As a result, we get a rice that's pretty productive and it is resistant to stem borders, right? We're not losing plants to pests, and we are increasing production at the same time. High yielding variety. So it's a very important technology from the 1960s. As a result of this, well, okay, here's nitrogen fertilizer on the top there, rapidly increasing. Phosphorus is another fertilizer, another thing we run out of the soils very quickly, so phosphorus is important also. The irrigated cropland from 125 units to 200 over to it, we've doubled, we've doubled the irrigation since the 1960s. Pesticide use, 1960, we weren't using a lot of pesticides. We had a lot more pesticides we developed after we moved World War II. They're petroleum based. And until we figured out how to make these poisons out of petroleum, we didn't really have a lot of pesticides. But oh boy, has that gone up. But as a result, food production has increased amazingly. Right? We've got increased cropland, 15% from irrigation. We get increased yield per acre from fertilizer, 70% of the whole increase in production from that alone. And then we're also cropping more intensive. We're doing double crops in the same year instead of just one crop. We're sometimes even three crops in some places instead of one or two crops to intensify. To intensify, you've got lots of nutrients. You have lots of nutrients and plants don't need those. Okay. This is the global food supply per capita on average. Per person in the world, in 1961, we were consuming about 2,100 calories, 2,150, right? By the end of this period, 2011, we are reducing, and this is not consumption, this is production, we are reducing about 2,800 calories per person. Is that more or less? <laughs> That's kind of amazing how much more it is. Now, does this mean that everybody has enough to eat? No. No, about 1.5 billion people in the world do not know where the next meal is coming. 1.5 billion people in the world do not know where the is coming from. In Sonoma County, last year, we had 40,000 households that required food assistance. In Sonoma County, 40,000 households required food assistance. They could not make enough money to buy food they needed. In Sonoma County. If you do not have money, you don't get food. Get it? Does that make sense? How can the market respond to you if you have a demand for food, you have no money? Can the market do that? Who's our president? <laughs> Obama. Obama, good, okay. He took a trip recently. Where did he go? Cuba. Cuba, good. Cuba, yeah, two weeks from Cuba. Now, what don't they have in Cuba? People are really upset about what they have in Cuba. What don't they have in Cuba? Some of the very important rights in this, right? Human right. What do, what do they have here? Freedom. Freedom. They don't have freedom. They don't have political freedom. They cannot speak against the government. They cannot do that. No political freedom. Do you have political freedom? Yes. Does your voice matter a lot in our elective process? Oh, you think so. <laughs> Go ahead and vote for Bernie, see what happens. Okay? <laughs> I'm not saying don't, but see what happens. See what happens. In Cuba, they don't have the right to do that. In the United States, we do. In the United States, do we have the right to starve to death? Yes. Because we can't afford food. Yes. Do we have the right to have shitty water? Yes. Do we have the right to not have sanitation? Yes. Do we have the right to be homeless? Yes. In Cuba, you don't have that right. In Cuba, you have a right to free housing, you have a right to free education, you have a right to a free need if you need it. Medical school is free. You've got to qualify for it, but it's free. Water is safe to drink. Sanitation works. What human rights matter? I was in Havana for a week. I saw three fellows who were homeless, they were profound alcoholics. 
all the people I taught were homeless, I saw nobody who was stunted, I saw nobody who was malnourished. Is it kind of tough sometimes? Yeah. The idea is in Cuba, you don't have the credit to starve. The state takes care of you. They don't have a market there, they have a system. So think about this as I'm going through this. Should we have a food market? Should we have a food market? What are the limits to the technologies? Okay. You can look at a piece of land and say, this is how much plant growth can grow there. You can calculate this. How much water is there, how much nutrient is there, how much sunlight is there. Temperature, all goes into that. Calculate maximum production plant. This diagram shows us of that production as possible, how much are humans consuming. If it is a very dark color, humans are consuming between 80 and 100 percent, in some places more than 100 percent, of what is possible to grow there. Are we eating a lot of the plant growth in the world today? And then again, look at India, look at China, look at North America. How much more potential is there if something else is going to live on this globe besides us? Because <coughs> the stuff that we're not eating, that's what's keeping everything else alive. Climate reduction. So there's limits there. How much meat can we produce? This is a diagram that shows the weight, the mass of all terrestrial mammals. All mammals in the world. Put the weight together, up and down scale. This is humans. This is cattle. Of all the terrestrial mammals in the world, this is what proportion is cattle. This is sheep, that's goats, this is elephants. Are we dominating the biosphere? <laughs> Look how much of the biosphere is going to keep humans alive, right? It's all about stuff that we So is there a lot of potential to expand? And still have some green squares? One wonders, one wonders. What about the technologies? Let's see, let's the technology. Pesticides are toxins. We're putting toxins into our environment, in particular pests. The problem is they don't just kill our pests. This is Pesticide production, 1945, it begins after World War II, the chemical industry takes off. We have since 1995, 1945, produced about 82,000 new chemicals. 82,000 new chemicals, those are petroleum pills. 82,000. How many of those have we tested for safety? 1,200. There are over 80,000 chemicals out there that we haven't even tested for safety. And pesticides are one of these. I want to show you one that we did test. Right? But I want to show you about the efficacy of the test. So this is atrazine. This one was widely used for herbicides. The herbicide kills plants. Right? The way that atrazine, and a lot of pesticides kill plants, is they, they work as a, an estrogen. Right? And estrogen is a formula that tells cells to multiply, to grow. And the way it actually works is basically the weed grows so fast that it, it chokes itself. If it grows after this fast resistance you can keep up with, it, it wilts and dies. It grows sick. Where do we find atrazine in human water supplies? Well, there's Texas, and Texas is a great place if you don't like laws. It is a great place if you don't like laws. A good place to live. So, let's test this soap. I produce a lot of this, and this is about 63 million pounds a year. A million pounds a year. More than any of us weigh, yes. So let's test this. Scientific method, independent variable, dependent variable. Change the independent variable, watch what happens with the dependent variable. Frog, add atrazine, see what happens. Frog, add atrazine, frog. It's safe. This is a scientific principle called all other variables constant. Now, geography hates them some scientific rules because we understand that you can never hold all the other variables constant. You can't do it. This may work in economics, so long as you're in classroom, but leave the classroom and, okay, nothing else happens. So, what happens, oh, the geographer might ask, if we expose atrazine to deadly radiation? <laughs> when could that ever happen, Jeff? That's ridiculous. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Cosmic rays. <laughs> what happens if you expose atrazine, the sunlight, and then show it to a frog? Oh. That always gets me right. <laughs> the atrazine changes.
changes its chemical form such that it weakens the little baby frog's immune system and allows nematodes to invade the changes to cellular structure. Right. Now this is just one thing that happens actually. What happens if it's warm? If it's cold? And what happens with this? And what we found with this is this not only affects your genes, it affects your epigenome. The epigenome is the stuff that your genes swim in. And that stuff you can swim in actually tells your genes when to turn on and when to turn off. And this stuff is terrible. You inherit your mother's epigenome. Right? We've been practicing for about four generations so far. Humans, we've had ten generations. What does this mean to you? Well, it's equal to grow. Grow, grow, grow. Can you think of a disease that is associated with unchecked cellular growth? And cancer, thank you very much. Breast cancer in the United States, 1975 2003. See a pattern? Yeah. Boys, do you care about this? Maybe not. Okay, guess what? Our sperm counts have been dropping about 1% per year since about 1910. Because we are feminizing our environment to the main pathogens. Limitations of irrigation. So, if you put water on the land, that water is coming from this place. It's quite obvious from the bottom of sides. It has minerals dissolved in it. If you do that experiment in the science class, we put some salt in the beaker and you evaporate off the water. And what you get left is a bunch of salty crust on the beaker. This is what happened to the irrigation that they were doing on a scale of hundreds of thousands of square miles. So, what we're getting is salt build up on our land. Do plants like to have salt in the roots? Now, salt actually reverses osmosis and pulls water out of the plant, so plants don't do well when we have alkalization. The other half problem that can happen with this is we can put too much water on the landscape and fill up that water table so it doesn't high. What happens if you plant if you overwater it? It wilts, right? Same thing, this is basically overwatering. And then in other places, we're sucking so much water out of the ground that uh, we're using up that resource. This is happening in Central Valley right now. In Central Valley, the land surface is actually dropping because we're sucking so much water out of the ground. So this is land that is too salinized to farm. Not all of this is from human processes, it's natural processes also, but a lot of this is from human process. And I've got various uh, hectares here that are lost. How big is a hectare? It's about 2.4 acres. <laughs> How big is an acre? You know that quad between um, Darwin and Stevenson? That's about an acre. So a hectare here is about twice that size. Right? So we're looking at losing 20 million of those to salinization in India, where food production is really important. This is where we're having water shortages now. I think it's red, we're sucking more water out of there than we can't sustain the suck for a few years. We eventually run out of water. What we're looking at here is potentially a loss in our productivity. That's what I'm getting at. What about fertilizer? Are there any downsides to that? Well, the most widely used fertilizer is nitrogen and uh, nitrogen oxide of various types. And what this does is this. About 5% of the nitrogen we put on our fields gets taken up by our plants. The rest gets put out the water system. It goes into the streams, in the alga, and the little plants in the stream go, yes, food, nitrogen, woohoo! They grow really well. And if you eat that, that's great, right? If you're a frog or something, you eat alga, that's great. And then it goes out to the ocean. When it's the ocean, the phytoplankton get a hold of this, and we go, I've got sunlight, I've got warm water, all I need is more nutrients, here it come. Yes! Yes! And if you eat that stuff, you're good it for you, right? But it dies eventually, right? Phytoplankton dies, bacteria dies, alga dies, sinks down in the water column where other bacteria eat it. Right? Yeah, and they eat it. In the process of eating it, they use all of the oxygen in the water. And as a result, the water off the coast of Louisiana and Texas doesn't have enough oxygen in it to really support oxygen breathing life, like fish, crabs, mollusks, farmers, oysters. So that red area is an area where there's not enough oxygen in the water for part of the year to survive. Globally, these hypoxic zones look like this. There's more than one. Every place a major river runs through an agricultural area and then out the ocean, we get a dead zone. These are some of the best fisheries in the world. And harbors, 100, 200, 1,000 miles away from the problem. 
the 1980s, we changed the Green Revolution from a public system to a privatized system. We neoliberalized it. We went from this idea that universities can do the best research to companies like Monsanto and Genentech saying, we can do that research, maybe even better, and then we can patent it and we can make lots of money out of it. The Green Revolution didn't patent anything. Whatever they came up with was for everybody. What we're going to do patent it, we're going to make money, and agriculture becomes not about growing food, it becomes about the profit. The downside of this is that the public institutions that need to do research, they get defunded. They basically get very weak. Look at Davis, and they were all funded, they were well, but other institutions go away. We now shift to private research, which then owns their production. And then we get to the concentration where we have a lot of power in the hands of a few very wealthy corporations. Monsanto did in tech to have those. Mechanization more recently has been putting pressure on farmers to upscale because if you buy a tractor, can you pay for a tractor with three acres of land? I'll tell you, no, you can't. It's the most valuable thing in the world. No, you can't. If you buy a tractor, you've got to have a bigger farm. If you get a bigger tractor, you have to have a bigger farm. Farm sizes in North America, in Australia, in Europe have been getting larger and larger and larger, which means family farms are going away. Ask your grandparents about farm aid in 1980. And they still actually have a conference. Neil Young and Willie Nelson get together and say, let's let's take the family farm in the US, but they're going away. In the US, it's happened. In other parts of the world, small farms are still where food is made. So this is Sub-Saharan Africa. The United States is about this big. Right? That's how big Africa is. We're looking at about 48 countries here. And if it's red, it's a very small farm. This is a family farm, maybe a little bit of If it's yellow, that's a small farm. OK, we're going to make some food bark, mostly for us. And then if it's blue, it's medium. And you see a lot of small, very small farms there. Yeah. These are still producing a lot of food. It's more about local consumption. Right? We're not going to buy stuff from these farmers. The local people can buy stuff from these farmers. But this is about local food security for people in these areas. The gene revolution is making it almost impossible for these small farmers to be the cost of doing business is what I'm going to put up. What are large farms doing? Well, let's see. This is Canada, 1970 2005. And what we're looking at is billions of dollars of agricultural exports. See, growing a lot, right? We go from uh, 2 million a year to 26 million a year. Maybe farmers are rocking. How are the farmers doing? Well, this is Saskatchewan, and this is average income for farm families. And if we go to 1926, well, depression is kind of rough. And then we go, wow, look at this area here, we're up around 20,000 a year. Now, in 1950, 20,000 is pretty good. So when we go to the 1980s, when the gene revolution starts coming in, and plants start being privatized, and we have to upscale our farms, and look, oh, it's moving below zero. Is that a good business model to have negative profits? How do they stay in business? <laughs> now, this is not just Canadian farms, it's American farms too. How do they stay in business? <laughs> subsidies, yes, subsidies. <laughs> subsidies. Tens of thousands of dollars a year to farmers in the United States to keep the farm going because they cannot make enough money selling their produce given their cost, given the Green Revolution, the Green Revolution. That that's the only way they stay in business. Where do the subsidies come from? From the government. The government. Where does the government get this money from? Taxes. Taxes from you. Yes, from you. So you are subsidizing those farmers. Where's the profit going? The profit's going to the large <coughs> industries. This is a diagram which is concentration at the wholesale scale. Farmers sell their stuff to somebody, they sell their stuff to wholesale. Now, in the United States, if you're growing beef, this is a few years ago, but if you're growing beef, 81% of all the beef purchased in the United States for wholesale, by wholesale, 
Let's buy Tyson ConAgra Carbill farmland. If you are a cattle farmer, unless you go to organic, that's who you're going to sell to. This is a cartel. All four of these companies are privately held, and they don't have to publish anything publicly. What they do is they get together every year and say, what's our price for beef this year? We've got to keep these guys in business, but that's all we've got to do. And the rest of the profit goes to us. We're the only ones selling to the markets, so then we get to set the price to the markets also. Tremendous market power here. Is this three markets? Well, this is monopolies. And the same goes for pork, it goes for oil, it goes for corn, it goes for soybean. Globally, globally, globally. So who's making money? How about GMO seeds? Thoughts about this? I'm going to spend time on it. If you want to learn more about GMO seeds and power structures, watch the Moody Corporation. It's free online, we have it in our library. It will tell you very carefully about how power structures work for GMOs and how Monsanto, especially, is very good at making farmers do precisely what they want and you get as much money as you possibly have the whole thing. How about climate change? Well, this is a projection just 10 years from now. Water stress. If it's green, it's going to be about what it is today. If it's blue, it's going to be better than today. Just in terms of water stress. Because it's temperature, it's water stress. And if it's uh, what these colors, it's going to be worse than today. How's China and India doing? It's 10 years from now. This isn't 50 years from now, 10 years from now. How about temperature? Well, let's see, because we're getting warmer temperatures, we're getting less vermalization, which means cold. Right? We're getting warmer nights, we're getting warmer winters. A lot of plants need a cold stretch, and a lot of insects hate cold stretches. The cold knocks down insects, and a lot of plants are adapted to cold. They take a bit of cold, the insects go, yay! Can you say Zika virus in your next year? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, how about five years? Because it's coming. Malaria is spreading north, dengue is spreading north. It's already in Southern California, it's all over Louisiana, Texas. You know, there are some green here, right? Right, there's green. So, um, let's see. Uzbekistan, that's green. Uzbekistan is producing a lot of food. Those dark greens is going to be 100% more, twice as much of almost nothing. Right? What is green up there for most of it? It's not highly productive land now, so a doubling isn't really all that much. This is what we're looking at. This is, this is for about 2050. We're having more extreme weather events. And more floods, and more droughts, and more windstorms. That's hard on our crops. And because we're putting more carbon into our atmosphere, our oceans are sucking up more carbon. Thank you, oceans. What the oceans do with that then is, well, the pH changes, and the ocean becomes more acidic. So much so that these little creatures that have these calciferic shells, like plankton, the shells are dissolving. Plankton is the base of the food chain in the marine ecosystem. If you take away the base of the food chain, how do everything else do? There's no food. There's no food. This is happening now. Because all of these things, many of these things, don't affect actually the pocketbook of the people in business, there's no way to sort of say the market can take care of this. There's no cost associated with this. We can load our ocean with carbon, there's no cost to it. Now, fishermen are going to take it, right? But that is bigger than the market. So we need something else. Some estimates say that by 2060, we're looking at losing 2 to 2.5 billion people of starvation. So this is your life, this is your child's life. This is what we're looking at you growing up in the world. The rest of the world, the world what it is. Now, Syria has about 20 million people. Syria, you've heard of Syria? The biggest ship in the world right now. What does the immigration out of Syria do to you? It's tearing it apart. That's 20 million people. Imagine 2 billion people trying to get into the EU and the US and Canada. Imagine that. Maybe we should do something about this. <laughs> what can you do? What do you freak out? Get depressed? Play games? Um, or, or this. And this is from Andy Leonard. Andy Leonard um, has done several videos on sort of stuff. So you can Google her and find out about it. She's now with me. Um, and what she's noticed over the years is that Americans then say, well, I'll change what I buy. Because we see ourselves as consumers, and our politicians and our elites like for us to see ourselves as consumers, because they like us to buy lots of stuff. That's what keeps them in money, right? They turn over lots of stuff, they spend lots of money, they make lots of profit. 
What Andy said is no, you're also a citizen. So we don't do this in the United States. Has anybody seen Michael Moore's latest movie? Thank you. One of you? <laughs> Two of you. What's the tuition in Slovenia? Zero. College tuition, zero in Slovenia. Yes, yes. Four years ago, Germany tried to raise their tuition to take colleges from 235 euro to 245 euro. 10 euro a year. That's about $13. They shut the universities down. They shut it down. The students shut it down. No, we're not going to pay anymore. What did you do when they raised income, when they raised tuition? Well, you weren't here. What would you have done? Well, the people who were here didn't do anything. They paid the tuition. Americans don't see themselves as active students. We see ourselves as students. And he says, we've got to get into this. When elites start taking too much, we've got to start putting limits on them. We did it in the 30s and the 40s. We can do it again. But it's going to take action from our citizens. So what can you do? Well, you can support, in terms of food, farms that do agroecology. Agroecology is this idea that I'm going to use life to create life. I'm not just going to have a, care, a field full of carrots. I'm going to have a field full of carrots and worms and birds that eat insects that bug my carrots and some other things that fix nitrogen in the soils. So plants can do that. I'm not going to buy more chemicals. Agroecology, you can do this. Our presentation, you can buy their stuff. FAO study in Africa. Oh my goodness. Shocking. It turns out that soil living bacteria and fungi can be used to boost crop yield. Did you know that soil living bacteria and fungi are in soils before bee killed it with pesticides? Yes, it's there. Worms. The amount of fertilizer needed to boost yields is far less than using inorganic <coughs> fertilizer. In other words, life. Bug poop on its own. How much does bug poop cost? How much money does Monsanto make off bug poop? Does Monsanto like this? Large-scale studies of Southern Africa, also <laughs> looking at different agroecology technologies. Right? So we're looking at crop varieties. So we're going to grow, grow some nitrogen-fixing crops, beans, peas, one, one season. We're going to grow some coffee or something over the next season. Right? We're going to have agroforestry. Uh, some trees are really good at fixing nitrogen, also. Right? Acacia trees are great. We're going to have conservation agriculture. So we're going to keep cover crops on the land so it rains and so it's all washed away. We're going to do um, integrated pest management. Instead of spraying chemicals, I'm going to put up a bird box. And the birds will come and eat the things that bug my plants. <laughs> How does that look about the bird box? Okay, right? Now, this was not a large study. It was only 29 million acres. And it being facetious, that's 45,000 square miles. That's a lot of space. And what they found here is that production it only about doubled. And this is just about helping farmers understand these living technologies that are available. No more cost than that. So what can you do? You can pressure the U.S. to support non-export agriculture. You can pressure your congressman for a global carbon tax. That's climate change. You could make mass bans at work. I mean, you've got to write it, you've got to complain about it when it doesn't work. In my 206 class, I have all my students ride the bus. It's free, you know. About half of them have never ridden a bus before. It's very interesting. Um, we need a new energy infrastructure. We can challenge the legal right to patent seeds, and you can help these three world leaders feel good about what we were saying last year. Yeah, we're going to do something about climate change. What you can't do is by yourself. Right? You yourself cannot do it. Real. So what you should do, if you are involved, if you are interested, if you care about this, is this. Google, find your elected officials, common cause. They will take you to the website. This website will have you put in your street number and your zip code and your city and state. And they will tell you who your state legislator is, who your state assemblyman is, who your county supervisor is, who your congressperson is, who your senator is. And how much does it cost to send an angry email to one of those people? Zero. No cost of a bit of time, right? And the beauty is you write one and send it all five. Okay? <laughs> you can do that. The other cool thing about common cause is look at this. They've got links to taking action. So it's not just about mailing, emailing comments. This is 
about things going on in your neighborhood, things you can get involved with, to make change of who you are. We can do that. We can do that. We can only do that if we do it. Okay? It doesn't change unless we change it. I'm hoping a few of you be interested enough in your future. Two cups of a vegetable? It's, it's 
So one of the things that geographers like to do is life cycle analysis. So we start at Earth and we go to the Earth, right? And what happens to that head of lettuce between here and there? Okay? That head of lettuce, well, okay, it may be perfectly far, we can put chemicals in the ground, we can CO2 in the air, energy. And then who works those needles? And what is it like to work those needles? Okay? And then we have transportation costs, we have transportation CO2. To the store, or like to work at a Safeway now. Well, they're trying to de-unionize. They're trying to cut the labor force. They want you to check your own groceries, so they don't have to pay anybody to do it, right? And then you take it home, you eat it. But if you're like most Americans, you throw away 30% of what you buy at the store. Americans throw away 30% of all the food they buy, right? That food then, instead of doing something good, like going to my compost, goes to landfill, when it degrades, it produces methane. Now, if you do it right, you throw all the stuff that produces methane under a big blanket, you plug the methane, that's natural gas. But we don't do that enough in this part of the world. So that's, that's the full life cycle. It's something to think about, uh, the, the whole toxin. A uh, student recommended Cowspiracy to me the other day, so I have not seen it yet. No, no. You should watch it. I will. One of the points here is that we feed a lot of food to our animals. And if we didn't feed food to our animals, we would have more food for ourselves. Yes? We would have less animals, we would have less methane production. Yes. But what civilizations tend to do, and China has certainly done this, and has they become wealthier, they eat more meat, not less. Right? We're going towards a meat diet. What we are, what we eat, the more food we put in the cow. How many pounds of weight does it take to make a pound of cow? Yeah. It takes about 10 pounds. 10 pounds of grain to make one pound of cow. So we can feed ourselves, or we can feed a cow and meat hunters. So, cow spirits, issues with, with meat, meat consumption. But, as I said, if you look at China, this pork consumption, which is what yeah. I just actually don't know this. Are you vegetarian or vegan? I am not religiously vegetarian or vegan. I do not cook meat in my home. If I go to somebody's house that's served, I have that. And the restaurant is happy, so I have that. So I'm not religious about it, but I I, I don't have it at home. Yeah. So I try to keep it my cooking as low as possible. So. You don't have to be religious about these things. What you do is you find compromise. You find things that are effective that work for you and it's better. And that's great for you. But remember, it doesn't stop with you. It's got to get outside of your household. If you want to change this, you've got to do something outside your household. Bunch of your friends. Don't get rattled. Rattle some doors. Rattle some windows.